Hello again, I am Blunty. In today's video, not a review, not a rant, not even social commentary. No, instead, I thought I'd share with you a personal story, a personal journey, as a matter of fact. My journey into becoming obsessed and passionate about photography and how this camera changed my entire life. Well, not my entire life, but changed a large portion of my life at least. Now, my camera journey started way back in the day, pre-beard and everything. Um, when my family had a little 110 format camera. They looked like spy cameras, which is why I loved it when I was a kid. And they took these little film cartridges of what they called 110 film, it just sort of snapped at the back, the back closed, and they had these snap-on flashes in blocks of four that would only fire once and then burn out. Because the flashes were expensive and film was expensive and, and it's not a toy, and you know, I, wouldn't, I wasn't allowed to play with it much. So it was just a cool thing that I used to play with without any film in it. I would run around the house and pretend to take spy shots and stuff like that because you know I was a kid and it looked like a spy camera, that's what you did. A few years on, I was going on a trip with some friends, sans family and, and adult supervision in general, and I thought, I need a camera for this trip. So I went out and bought a sort of $30, $35 plastic lensed little rangefinder piece of crap that was, it was basically the equivalent of the cheapest of the cheap point and shoot digital cameras you get these days, except obviously it wasn't digital at all. It was film because everything was filmed back then. And that's when we come to this guy. So a few years later, I was actually doing small press comics. I had fallen in love with comic books. I was writing and, and doing a thumbnails of my own. A friend of mine was doing the, the fine line and everything, and that's sequential image storytelling. Each one of those comic book frames is essentially a photograph hand-drawn. It's composed the same way. The, you, you tell the story in a similar sort of way. So I started taking photography classes to help me learn more about that and become a better artist in general. And that's where this guy comes in. This, the Pentax K1000, is the de facto standard for learning photography, or at least it was in the mid-90s when I was first learning photography, these things were common as muck, and they made them for decades. They started making them in 1978, and they kept making them all up until the early 90s because they were that good. Even though technology had marched on, there were better cameras out there, there were smarter cameras out there with electronics in them and stuff that would automatically gauge your exposure and everything, but not these. These were pretty much just unbreakable. They're a solid slab of metal, basically. Everything is manual. And that's what made them so good to learn on. So you had to learn everything about cameras and photography to learn to use one of these effectively. You had to learn how to manual focus properly. You had to learn how to set your aperture manually. You had to learn how to set your shutter speed manually. You even had to set your ASA speed, or what we call now the ISO speed of your film manually. Everything about this camera forced you to understand, really understand, everything that was going on. You absolutely had to learn that stuff. You had to know it. It had to be in your brain properly. Otherwise, the pictures you were trying to take wouldn't come out. They would be underexposed or overexposed or your shutter speed was too low and they'd be all blurry or, you know, you just, these things are the ultimate learning tool. These things taught a generation, several generations of photographers actually, how to be photographers. And that is why I wanted one because it's part of my history and part of photography history in general. It is a special, bit of kit, the Pentax K1000. And I've been looking for one for quite some time. Now, because they were so common, they're not too hard to find, and most of them still work perfectly. The only thing that ever broke on these things pretty much was the light meter, which is important because everything's manual, so you need to be able to meter your light uh, levels properly. Um, and on a few, you'll get the, the mirror lockup uh, won't sort of flop back down. That was, you know, a mechanical problem because moving parts eventually do wear out. Um, but other than that, they're just they're nearly unbreakable, basically. But I wanted a good one, a nice clean one, one that hasn't been used in a school for 20 years and it's all scuffed up and marked and broken. And I finally found one this weekend just gone at a camera market that runs two or three times a year here in Sydney. Um, and I found it and it, it was sitting there shiny and, well not shiny, it had a bit of dust on it, but otherwise unmarked. There's a small mark on a little pentaprism up there, but otherwise it's just a glorious example of the camera. It's near perfect. It's, 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 I was brilliant, I was blown away. It had a 50mm lens on it, which is the same lens I learned to shoot on, F2, and the guy wanted 100 bucks for it. I didn't even bother haggling with the guy, I just handed him over the $100. Here, here's $100, I want this camera, I'm walking away with this camera. And he had a look on his face like, I probably could have asked for more, but I didn't care. I had the camera body, I had a nice lens on it, the same focal length, I think probably even the same kind of lens that I learnt on, because that was a 50mm f2 lens as well. It might have been a slightly different version, but I don't care. But it is what I learned on, it was so important. So I walked around the camera market, and then I found a 28mm lens uh, for the same mount, the, the K-mount system, which is still the same system they're using today, all the Pentax cameras. So even these 30-year-old lenses I can use on on the newest Pentax DSLR out there, which is kind of cool. 
Um, but I found a 28 mil lens, f 2.8, I think it was, for 10 bucks. And it looked perfectly clean. And so I snapped that up as well. And I, I've just been having a blast. And I've just put through two rolls of color film through it to test the lenses. And I would normally want to shoot in black and white. Uh, and in fact, I've just bought a bunch of uh, different black and white films to sort of test out. But I needed to put some color film through it just to, to test how these lenses were working, see if there were any light leaks in the camera, see if there were any aberrations in the lenses and how the lenses perform and if the light meter was working properly. Because if all my shots were underexposed or overexposed, I'd know I'd have to recompensate for the light meter fault or anything like that. But it worked perfectly. In fact, let me show you some of the shots that I took. Now, keep in mind, I wasn't trying to be particularly arty with these shots. These shots were all about sort of testing the camera and the lenses and testing the light meter and everything. So I didn't get, uh, I didn't get very adventurous with them. But what I got out of it, I was quite pleased with. The, the film I was using was, um, was this, this crappy lomography stuff, which is just what I had to hand. It was something that it was quick and easy to get. And it's basically, it's, like most lomography stuff, it's cheap and nasty and awful. So these pictures are horribly grainy. I mean, the grain is the size of your fist, really. It's just just crappy, crappy film, and I will never be buying it again. But I have already bought a bunch of other film, good film, German-made film, that uh, black and white film, as a matter of fact, because that's what I learned to shoot on as well, that uh, should be much, much finer grained and much more elegant. The tones are going to be nicer. But the, the, the colour stuff that I've got out of it um, has shown me that the camera works perfectly the exposure metering works perfectly the lenses i got are nice and clean and clear and don't have any weird aberrations or anything in them i didn't get any prints but i did have them scanned in at the place that did the developing for me who are a specialist place to, who just opened up in sydney about six or so months back um what I didn't know is the scanning they do is only about six megapixels worth of data and um, you can get much more of that out of film really. Uh, next time I may get prints and just scan them myself or buy my own film scanner or something like that because I'm not really happy with the scanning job they did on them. Um, but for the purposes I actually took these photos, they work just fine. You know, they get the job done. They tell me everything I need to know about the operation of the camera. So now when I go out there with some decent film in there, some good film, some black and white film, some German made film, um, I know what I'm dealing with. I know I can trust the light meter. I know uh, that the focus is good. I, I know how the lenses perform. I can sort of start to get a grip on on taking some, some more serious shots, some proper shots, some carefully considered shots, some some artistic shots and crap like that, you know? Really, uh, really enjoy the camera. Now, I'm not going to shoot on it all the time, obviously, because developing is expensive, much, much more expensive than digital photography. Um, but it is still something that's enjoyable to me. It's it's nostalgic. It, it, it reminds me of the old ways. It, may, it forces me to, to work in the old ways, too, which is always good to get a good reminder about what it's like to work in a truly manual world when the only real control you have is aperture and shutter speed because you can't even change your ISO speed of course because that's that's locked into the film chemistry um, whereas on a digital camera you've got all three of those things to constantly play with and fiddle with to your heart's content so it's good for me on a photography technician level to uh, refresh myself about exactly what it means to start playing within those limits so I've walked away from this absolutely ecstatic that I now own a lovely example of this classic camera, this, this Pentax K1000. It's even one of the ones that were made in Japan. Because with this camera, the earlier versions, for the first few years, they made them in Japan and they were built really well. They had all metal parts and they were, had the Asahi branding uh, on there as well. And later on, uh, when they became a bit more of a commodity, when they were focusing more on the fancy cameras with automatic exposure modes and stuff like that, they moved manufacturing of these over to China and they started making certain parts out of it out of weaker metal and even plastic in some instances, like the film winder and stuff like that. Um, and those ones don't hold up so well uh, to times wear and tear, which is why I specifically wanted a Japanese made one. So I am understandably really, really excited about finally owning this camera. Now, I'm not one of those hipster douches who think film cameras are the best, blah, 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 and time, you know, the, the digital cameras, blah, there's no soul in digital photography. It's complete horseshit. That's pretentious rubbish. Digital is better than film these days and has been for some time now. Digital cameras do things that film cameras can't. They perform better, they're, they're more sensitive to light, they're easier to use, they're smarter. Everything about them is better. But the only reason I love 
shooting on film. And I've only just rediscovered that I do love shooting on film because I've only just started doing it for the first time in 16 years. But there is a certain passion to the way film makes you shoot. You've got limited exposure. You can't go click, 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 click. You have to really, really think, is that worth taking a photo of? Or oh, I missed it, damn, too late. All that kind of stuff. Um, and you really have to, when you get to the end of your film roll, you go, oh, I've only got two shots left. And you start getting really, really picky about what your last couple of shots are going to be. Uh, or you're walking towards the place where you're going to develop. Oh, I've still got a couple of shots. Oh, bugger, I'll take that and that. It just, it makes you think in a really different way than, digital photography has. And I got on board the digital train very, very early as well. This was the last film camera I ever shot on. Uh, I started using digital cameras way back, even before they had megapixels, you know. The first digital camera I had was this little Kodak thing that was that belonged to the college, and I shot the, uh, the yearbook photos on it. I was the, the yearbook photographer, and I shot all the class photos on this little Kodak digital camera. It saved images directly to a floppy disk. They were 640 by 480. That's 0 0.3 of a megapixel in today's terminology. Um, later on, I bought this little Samsung 800K camera, so 0 0.08 of a megapixel. Um, and then the, the, and then from then on in, it was, you know, all about the megapixels and stuff. I think the next one I got was five or eight megapixels. And from then on in, I just, I've collected a bunch of digital cameras and, and some of them are really interesting. Some of them haven't been interesting, but none of them mean as much to me personally, to my personal story as the Asahi Pentax K1000. Another interesting thing to note, just before we go, Asahi is also the brand name of my favorite Japanese beer. Actually, my favorite beer, full stop. It's just del fucking delicious. So um, I'm going to load some black and white film in this thing and um, wait for a social event of some kind or do some portraiture or go out in landscapes. I don't know what I'm going to do, but every now and again, I'm going to put a roll of film through this thing and I'm just going to feel something kind of special. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty, and I will catch you next time. If you have a, uh, a camera history story of your own to share, please feel absolutely free to share it in the comments or if it's long like mine, uh, make a response video.